We have more for your ears only. I'm Eddie Robinson. I'm David Alpern with this quote from the news. They were kind of sadists, really brutal. That was Igor Lutsenko, a Ukrainian activist hospitalized after a beating by supporters of the government, while talks continue to end violence against other protesters, which so far has been linked to five deaths. Now this. It is regrettable. Yes, it is regrettable to me and to the people of Syria that representatives of States in this room are sitting with us today while the Syrian blood is on their hands. What we have achieved is not merely a temporary agreement on a specific issue, but a prelude to future agreements and engagement. We think the so-called metadata telephony program uh, has not been essential, uh, has not contributed significantly to the prevention uh, of terrorist attacks in the United States or abroad. The bitter words of Syrian Foreign Minister Walid al-Mualam were matched by those of rebel leaders at off-again, on-again peace talks backed by Washington and Moscow in Geneva last week, though by the weekend both sides agreed at least to meet in the same room. Excluded from the talks at U.S. insistence, for better or worse, was one of Syrian President Hafez al-Assad's key backers, Iran. But Iranian President Hassan Rouhani made a splash nearby at the Davos Economic Summit, suggesting financial benefits to all from the temporary deal to freeze Tehran's nuclear program. Many experts see as exaggerated both the promise of Iran's emergence from economic isolation and its threat to international security. And former Bush White House anti-terror advisor Richard C. Clarke noted the conclusion of a panel appointed by President Obama that the security benefits of some controversial NSA communications surveillance also were exaggerated, illegal, and should be scrapped. To explore all those developments for your ears only, we're joined again by 28-year CIA veteran Paul Piller, now a non-resident senior fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Security Studies and the Brookings Institution, and a blogger at nationalinterest.org. Welcome back to the program. Good to be with you. Is there value in getting both sides in the Syrian conflict into the same room, even if the regime refuses to consider ceding power to a transitional government as the rebels demand to end the war whose death toll may have passed 130,000? The big unanswered question in the Syrian situation is how or why a regime could be persuaded to essentially negotiate its own demise, especially since uh, lately it hasn't exactly been losing the war. So uh, I think we ought to be very pessimistic about the results to come out of this uh, Geneva conference, even though it never hurts to get people in the same room. Some say local ceasefires and access for humanitarian aid only help entrench the regime, still the key power involved with removal of chemical weapons. What's your view? Well, there's always an implicit recognition of at least a temporary continuation of the incumbent regime when you have something like the chemical weapons deal or access arrangements for humanitarian aid. I think on balance that is still a good thing. Uh, The chemical weapons deal was a good thing. If it is successfully completed, that would be a major blow on behalf of nonproliferation. And since the prospects are dim, Uh, With regard to political change, I think we ought to accept those sorts of agreements. Was it a mistake for the U.N. Secretary General to invite Iran to the peace talks or for the U.S. to make him withdraw it? What could its presence harm or help? Uh, It was a mistake for the U.S. to make him withdraw it. I I think the Russian Foreign Minister, Mr. Lavrov, put it uh, quite appropriately regarding the issue of Iranian participation in this conference. He said, you don't just talk to people you happen to like. You talk to people uh, who have a role in being able to settle an issue or resolve a situation. Even if you make the worst assumption about Iran being a spoiler, they would more likely be a spoiler if they were excluded from the diplomatic process than if they were included. What warning for the peace talks do you see from the escalating violence in Cairo last week, as well as in Libya and Iraq, all previously subject to regime change? I think a lot of people both inside and outside the Middle East are drawing correctly the lesson that simply getting rid of a regime that we don't happen to like is not the key to a more peaceful future for the country in question. 
Turning to the Iran nuclear deal, the White House has indicated that it mandates some destruction of enrichment equipment or connections, but won't release the actual text. Tehran says it only agreed to a slowing or freeze in operations. How do you read reports on Tehran's compliance? What we're hearing in terms of the rhetoric in both Washington and Tehran are efforts by the negotiators on each side to sell the deal to hardliners on their own side. Um, so naturally, the Iranians and Mr. Rouhani are saying, you know, we didn't give up the store, we actually got a lot, and obviously the Obama administration is saying the same thing. In this case, it's actually the Obama administration that is speaking more truthfully. There was a report last week on the actual inadequacy of U.S. intelligence to be sure about the status of nuclear sites, other weapons of mass destruction. Do you think continuing negotiations can bring Tehran's proximity to a nuclear weapon close enough to satisfy it and far enough to give Washington, Israel, and the rest of the world confidence it can be halted by force if necessary? There definitely is ground for an agreement that will satisfy the needs of both sides. Uh, the need on our side to be assured that Iran is not going to get a nuclear weapon, assured peacefully, not with result, uh, with the resort to force, and for the Iranians to say that they still have uh, a peaceful nuclear program. If this deal does not get completed, it won't be because there is not sufficient negotiating space. It will be because hardliners on one side or the other or both uh, will have torpedoed the deal. You've made an interesting observation about the way the Tehran deal uh, has run into the congressional politics of Obamacare. If uh, a final agreement is reached with Iran, this would be one of the most and perhaps the most significant foreign policy achievements of the Obama administration. And I fear that just with, uh, as we saw with the Affordable Care Act, the president's signature domestic program, we have a lot of Republicans who seem to be opposing it because they wish to deny a Democratic president a significant achievement. Given the cold shoulder Washington gave Tehran on the Syria talks, uh, what promise do you see uh, for the nuclear talks to produce more engagement with the West on other matters? There is considerable potential, if a nuclear deal is reached, for this to uh, spread out into other forms of engagement on other issues, be they Afghanistan, drugs, Iraq, uh, stability in the oil market. But the nuclear issue has become so salient and so important in the eyes of so many people here that that has to be dealt with first. What's your reaction to President Obama's speech on NSA phone call surveillance now that two White House panels have said it should be reined in or scrapped? The president clearly felt a political need to be making some difference uh, in existing programs, while at the same time not causing real harm uh, to the intelligence mechanism designed to keep Americans safe. And I think he struck about the right balance. Uh, his own advisory panel, by the way, certainly didn't say anything about you know, scrapping the metadata program by the NSA. They had some recommendations having to do with additional requirements for court orders for individual searches and so on. But overall, I think uh, the president threaded this needle pretty well. 28-year CIA veteran Paul Piller is now a non-resident senior fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Security Studies and the Brookings Institution and a blogger at nationalinterest.org. Quote from the news, cruel and obscene mutilation of a dead body. That was the charge filed by the husband of a brain-dead pregnant woman against a Fort Worth hospital before a judge ordered it to end life support for her and a fetus that hospital lawyers agreed was not viable. Next politics versus citizenship for your ears only.